Well, hello and welcome to the Briefing Room uh, webinar series brought to you by Climate Works Australia. I'm John Thwaites. I'm the chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and Climate Works Australia, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land throughout Australia and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I'm uh, currently sitting in the lands of the Arakwal people of the Bunjalung Nation. This month, uh, the world's eyes were glued on Glasgow as the Scottish city hosted world leaders for the COP26 climate change summit. The leaders were urged to be ambitious so collectively nations could tackle obvious climate hurdles. However, I think it's fair to say that the outcomes from COP26 were mixed. Australia, unfortunately, did not increase its 2030 target as other nations like the US, Canada, the United Kingdom did. And on one uh, index, Australia was in fact ranked last for ambition on climate action. Countries like Australia that didn't lift their 2030 targets have been asked to come back next year with an updated commitment at the next COP. And there are serious expectations that we will do that. So much work needs to be done to decarbonize the Australian economy. But today we'll be focusing on just one sector and that's infrastructure. The Infrastructure sector includes everything from our roads and railways, hospitals and schools, to public housing, telecommunications, waste and water management facilities. So it's a sector that massively shapes our way of life and our well-being. It also supports jobs and drives economic growth. In fact, infrastructure accounts for around 21% of the national GDP. After two years of living through a pandemic, we're now seeing substantial government investment in infrastructure. A 10 year rolling infrastructure pipeline has been designed to help rebuild the Australian economy. In dollar terms, what that means is that the federal government has committed $15.2 billion to new infrastructure projects. That's expected to support over 30,000 jobs on top of the 100,000 jobs already supported by the existing infrastructure pipeline. And of course, state governments have significant infrastructure spends underway also. Crucially, what we know is that infrastructure influences around 70% of Australia's annual greenhouse gas emissions. So infrastructure is critical to achieving net zero ambitions in this country. Question for today is what will it take to turn infrastructure green? Australia has a great opportunity to deliver infrastructure that can support sustainable, resilient and inclusive outcomes and to invest in a future that would benefit all Australians. So what are the decisive and practical actions that the infrastructure sector can take to drive climate initiatives across the country? And how can the infrastructure sector show leadership in the fight against global warming and build back better after the onslaught of COVID-19? Well, let's ask our panel. And over the next hour, you're going to hear from our wonderful panel, uh, Romilly Madhu, the Chief Executive Officer for Infrastructure Australia, Henry Blah, the Chief Content Officer for the Global Infrastructure Hub, and Margot Delafalouz, the Systems Lead for Cities at Climateworks Australia. Now, after we've heard from our panelists, you will have the opportunity to ask 
questions to our panel. And so if you've got a question, please jot it down in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So let's get started. First up, let's welcome uh, Romilly Maju, the CEO of Infrastructure Australia. Uh, Romilly, I think most people in infrastructure know very well. Uh, before joining Infrastructure Australia, Romilly was the CEO of the Green Building Council of Australia for 13 years. And in acknowledgement of her contribution to Australia's sustainable building movement, she was awarded an Order of Australia in 2019. Well, good afternoon, Romilly, and great to have you with us. If I could start with the first question, COVID-19 has presented our country with a number of challenges. And one of course has been the steep economic dip. So there's now an appetite to invest in big infrastructure projects to stimulate the economy after COVID. Where do you think net zero ambitions sit as part of that economic growth vision? And is there a growing momentum in the Australian uh, infrastructure sector to also focus on sustainability, resilience, and climate action as part of the recovery plan? Thanks, John. So I'm here on Ngunnawal country in Canberra. It's a parliamentary sitting week. Uh, so welcome from Canberra. And I really, it's, a, it's such an honour to be uh, speaking and talking with John Thwaites, who was one of our former board members when I was on the Green Building Council. And I still remember when he was Deputy Premier of Victoria and the impact he had on the Green Building Movement. So it's wonderful having this Q&A with John. Uh, a lot has happened in the last couple of years when it comes to infrastructure, but let me just paint a picture for you, for you to understand the importance of where infrastructure sits in our economy. Over 20% of the GDP, GDP is attributed to the infrastructure, the public infrastructure sector. There will be 100% growth in public infrastructure activity peaking at 52 billion by 2023. However, a recent report from the Australian Business Roundtable for Disaster Resilience and Safer Communities found that natural disasters cost the Australian economy 38 billion a year. And just on the culture side, construction is the most male dominated sector in Australia with only 12% of the workforce being female and less than 2% of on-site roles held by women. So the case has been made for why infrastructure must align with the transition to a net zero. Firstly, the states and territories uh, have all committed to net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. Uh, and you would have seen an announcement coming out of Glasgow by the Treasurer of New South Wales, Matt Keane, who talked about the net zero emissions policy forum uh, that he's running with New South Wales ACT in South Australia and Climate Works is going to be the Secretariat of. But that's just to give you a, a kind of a feel for the work that's happening at a state and territory level, and I'm sure other states and territories will be coming involved. Secondly, when you think about infrastructure, all the states and territories have been either in introducing a new state infrastructure strategy or updating an existing state infrastructure strategy because of COVID. And all these strategies include climate related impact, sustainability and, and resilience. As I've mentioned, uh, infrastructure spending is at a record high, but decisions don't systematically align with net zero emissions outcomes and risk of investment in future uh, stranded assets. Infrastructure influences 70% of emissions as John men has mentioned. So infrastructure decisions can either lock in emissions or accelerate decarbonisation across all sectors. What we're seeing is investors and asset managers are also increasingly committing to aligning their portfolios to net zero emissions. So, so I said private sector there, I said uh, investors and asset managers. And, and this, this really came out recently two weeks ago in the AFR Infrastructure Summit. I, I, the shift in, in, in two years was amazing. All of them talked about sustainability and resilience. It was constantly in all the narratives in the Q&A. Uh, you can see a, a use, an increased use of rating tools such as the Infrastructure Sustainability Tool or Green Star on the in cross infrastructure assets in social and economic infrastructure and reporting to both GREDS, the Global ESG Benchmark for Real Assets or TCFD Task Force on Climate 
financial related financial disclosure is also being used. And finally, we're seeing, and again, IA has done some work with um, Monash Sustainability Institute on this. On your see, a lot of the private sector is, is, has been responding and um, reporting to uh, sustainable development goals. So Infrastructure Australia has also been on a journey. Uh, we're the federal government's independent infrastructure agency, but all the states and territories have uh, I, I bodies as well, and we, we work together as an I bodies network. So our journey around promoting sustainability and resilience has been through a number of ways. Firstly, through our sustainability principles, which we released earlier in the year, which follows quadruple bottom line. And we use the sustainability principles across and aligns with all our policy. So all the policy that's been released since aligns with our sustainability principles. Further, we released a uh, pathway to sustainability infrastructure resilience. That was two documents that we did with Infrastructure New South Wales. And this was really around the importance of embedding resilience thinking in planning. Uh, and it's crucial. We did two papers, one being opportunities for system, systemic change and 10 directions for transformational and systemic change in infrastructure planning. And the second one is guidance for asset owners and operators in short term. Uh, and finally, we updated our assessment framework. And our assessment framework is really important because we uh, put out the infrastructure priority list, which is known as the pipe fund, pipeline, an unfunded investment pipeline for governments to consider. And we also uh, do an assessment of any project over 250 million seeking funding from the federal government. So how our assessment framework is and what is in our assessment framework uh, is crucially important. So it has undergone a significant refresh and in it, we now include specific advice on resilience considerations in major infrastructure investment. And we, we expect those major investments include in their business cases, physical climate risks, risk associated with the transition to a low carbon economy, community resilience to a broad range of shocks and stresses and broader behavior of technology and economic changes. And I could talk on and on and on, give you more examples, but I'm gonna leave it at there. Well, let's, let's build a bit on what you were talking about there, Romilly, which was the plans that Infrastructure Australia released last year. And amongst that, you did set, a, as I understand, a 15 year roadmap for the infrastructure sector. And you called for a number of major reforms. Can you tell us what some of those major recommendations and reforms are? Sure. And it was actually um, last month, not last year. So we, sorry, uh, sorry, last month, I meant last that's month. That's all right, that's fine. So the, uh, we are uh, required under our act to put out an audit and then following a plan. So we put out the audit in 2019 before COVID and that really looked at 180 challenges and opportunities across economic and social infrastructure. And, you know, we called out the importance of um, the impact of climate change and the importance of sustainability and resilience there. Uh, and then so the plan that we've subsequently released is really a pragmatic and practical um, response to a number of uh, issues that we're dealing with. And it also takes into account uh, COVID. So it looks at the challenges and opportunities uh, from 2019, as mentioned. So the plan looks at economic and social infrastructure and it has three cross-cutting themes. So place, sustainability and resilience and um, the infrastructure sector. And there are a couple of key themes in it, uh, change and uncertainty. Uh, so even before we were dealing with COVID, remember we dealt with terrible bushfires, uh, we've been dealing with uh, droughts and also extreme weather events. So you, we'd already been seeing these climatic changes occurring and its impact on infrastructure. And then on top of that, we then had the challenges around, um, around COVID, but also cyber attacks and other uh, shocks and stresses that had been occurring uh, to our infrastructure. Uh, we're looking at the moment in digitization. digitalization, if you think about how you know, we all went to online learning and online work uh, through, through COVID, unlocking the potential of every place. Uh, through COVID, we've seen this movement into the regions and the opportunities uh, of Australia's diverse uh, geography, minimum service levels and delivering public uh, value and finally um, customer empowerment through data. So the key areas of reform, and I'm just gonna give you the highlights. Uh, you can download the Australian Infrastructure Executive Summary or the whole plan, uh, which is on our website. So the highlights, place-based outcomes for communities. We keep talking about the importance of place and recognizing the uniqueness of individual place and unlocking the potential of every location. 
Secondly, sustainability and resilience, balancing infrastructure outcomes in an uncertain future. But also when considering sustainability and resilience, it actually cuts across the whole plan. Thirdly, industry productivity and innovation. We want to see uh, a step change in productivity. Fourthly, transport, delivering on an integrated network. Fifthly, energy, enabling an affordable transition to a net zero future. Six, water, prioritising safety and security. Seven, telecommunications and digital, ensuring equity in an era of accelerating digitalisation. There is a digital divide and it occurs and we need to ensure that we're minimising that digital divide. Eight, social infrastructure, supporting economic prosperity and quality of life. And nine, waste, accelerating Australia's transition to a circular economy. Um, but the whole plan is quite large. I'm actually, my computer's sitting on it. It's like that thick, 600 and something pages. But the executive summary goes, gives you a really great narrative about what the reforms that we're looking at. So there's 29 reforms and a lot of actions and recommendations. So, uh, Romilly, that website people could look at, where do they find Infrastructure that? Australia. So just Google Infrastructure Australia and it should come straight up on the website. And Rom, you talked about the bushfires before, and we've certainly suffered terribly from those and also uh, more recently some floods and other severe weather events. It's pretty clear that uh, climate change is increasing the risk of bushfire and the impact of these severe weather, weather events. So there is an urgency about action to reduce emissions. If we're focusing on the how for infrastructure, what, what's one key action that the infrastructure sector can take to reduce emissions to achieve net zero? Really simple. Embed sustainability and resilience targets, frameworks, embed whatever you can into the planning and procurement of the infrastructure projects that are being developed. We are at the highest level of our spending in infrastructure stim stimulus that we've ever seen before. Uh, on, using our old assessment framework, we looked at 30 uh, evaluations, business case evaluations that we'd reviewed. And in our old assessment framework, we had the impacts of climate change in there and it was voluntary, uh, but it was in there. Of the 30 we reviewed, none of them, zero had looked at and considered the impacts of climate change in those business cases. When we think about that the states and territories and the private sector, as I've talked about, uh, their shareholders, stakeholders, community expectations around net zero sustainability and resilience, it needs to be embedded right up front. So all of you watching, if you are working for consulting firms or for government, it just, it's gotta be business as usual. You have to see it in the tenders in anything that is going out, it needs to be embedded in there and it needs to be reportable. And, and the, the tools are already there. I've talked about the infrastructure sustainability um, rating tool. And I've talked about Green Star and there's Neighbours and there's many others. The tools exist. So there is no reason why it can't be embedded right up front because what we will end up with is stranded assets. And our assets are long-term assets. Infrastructure is a 50 to 100 year time span. So we need to ensure that we're embedding all these principles right up front. I was asked by a councillor the other day whether infrastructure projects should be reporting to the public on their embedded emissions. What do you think about that? So when, we're, when you look at our assessment framework, we, uh, we, we have a, a, a subtle warning, I'm not sure it's that subtle, warning in our assessment framework saying, uh, we call out the importance of sustainability and resilience and incorporating that into business cases. However, we will be in, con seriously considering in our updated assessment framework, because uh, we'll start looking at that in the next two years. And we'll be looking at embedded carbon. We'll be looking at materials. If you think about infrastructure, steel and concrete uh, have high emissions. Uh, so, and, and you can, the accounting of embedded car carbon already exists. Uh, you will find that there, the sophistication and the reporting will, will now be ramping up because there'll be an expectation that we'll be able to say the impact of this project uh, on, on, our, uh, on our environment uh, 
and, and on the economy because that also has an impact on the economy and that we are reporting on it. Great. Well, thanks, Rom. Uh, we'll come back to you in question time. So if people have questions, please jot them down in the Q&A section of your screen and we'll get to them shortly. In the conversation now, we're discussing how we prepare Australia's infrastructure sector for the level of commitment expected in all countries arising out of COP26 and the Paris Climate Agreement. And today our focus is very much on solutions. What are the, what are the solutions that should be adopted? Uh, I do want to now turn to our next, um, our next speaker, who's Henry Blass. And with Henry, we're going to talk about the world stage, how uh, the world is going in implementing new uh, measures to reduce emissions. And Henry is the Chief Content Officer at the Global Infrastructure Hub. So welcome, Henry. How you doing? Uh, Henry, what do you think COP26 has changed about how nations will approach infrastructure? What shifts are we likely to see when it comes to decarbonising things like buildings, industry and transport? Thanks, John. Great. I mean, great question. Obviously, uh, we, we all have seen uh, maybe too, too, too much of uh, you know, too many pledges uh, and announcements, even before the event from the, from the private and, and, uh, and the public sector. Uh, I mean, the, the, the good news to uh, at, at the end of COP is that we still have, when you look at the G20 countries, uh, which are the countries we work with the most, um, they've now all pledged carbon neutrality with a deadline. They, not all the country are 2050, but I think if we compare that to where we were two or three years ago, it's still um, a very significant shift. Um, within that, I, I would also say that the, the conversation about the, the role of infrastructure in achieving those outcomes uh, has matured quite, quite significantly. Uh, however, what we're seeing as well is that there's still very few countries that uh, beyond those pledge have the infrastructure strategies, let alone plans, to actually achieve those targets uh, or guidelines to build infrastructure that's actually compatible with, with those targets. Uh, and obviously carbon neutrality is a very ambitious target. Um, on the enabling environment side, and I think we really touched on that uh, as well, we, we've seen a clear change. Like it, I call climate mainstreaming, uh, is the world support system behind the strategies and plans has shifted dramatically towards climate, uh, climate transition. Uh, I, don't, I, I can't think of any uh, infrastructure agency, treasury, international organization, uh, consultant, uh, firms, uh, that, that's not in the process of mainstreaming climate in the decision uh, in hiring senior experts in the subject, uh, all the way to central banks, uh, actually. So, so while the, the amount of announcement to coalition can sometimes feel uh, overwhelming, uh, this is probably what, what it will take to address a very complex challenge, uh, a complete change across, across the board. So now if we look at, uh, at uh, I think, Romilly priority number one, which is integrating decision uh, climate into decision making, we'd see uh, also a very clear shift when it comes to mitigation and adaptation resilience. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around the need to align strategies and plans to those uh, to, to, to those targets, uh, especially around the built on, the relationship between the built environment, energy sector, and, and the transport sectors. But those plans, what we see is that sometimes those plans are not exactly coordinated between projects, but also regional, national level, uh, and that's where I think those. Um, those frameworks are absolutely essential, and, and Australia is, is seen as a as the leader in uh, in sort of creating those frameworks and, and you know th those plans, uh, and could potentially sort of leverage and know how a lot of countries are sort of looking for, for example, from uh, uh, from, from 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 around here. Um, so uh, again, this, uh, I think this, this is great news in, uh, in a sense. There's, uh, the overall ecosystem is moving towards integrating that. Uh, all the way to the financial, uh, to the financial sectors, uh, we're seeing the systemic nature of climate risk being more and more integrated through TCFD, uh, some, some work done by other organizations like CCRI, uh, and really sort of moving beyond just saying climate is important, but actually integrating it in the way decisions are made. Uh, that, that move uh, is being tackled also so at the global level, global regulation level by, by the G20. This year, we, we've seen unprecedented uh, collaboration between China and the US um, on what, what is called the sustainable um, 
uh, sustainable working group, uh, and they, they all agreed on creating an international sustainability standard board, uh, the ISSB, uh, which is a you know uh, an organization you're going to hear about more more in the future, and that board will really sort of work on uh, on reducing greenwashing and develop, developing a global baseline standard for for sustainability disclosure by by private companies. Uh, so it's so a great movement there, uh, and I think Romani already touched on the the enormous change at you know the private sector level. Uh, beyond those regulation, uh, beyond the ESG uh, ratings, the Grace Beer reporting, TCFD, etc. There's a lot of coalition that have been built, a lot of organizations that have been increasing, increasingly sort of building their own sort of carbon neutrality pledges uh, and, uh, and sort of developing strategy to address them. Henry, uh, arising out of COVID, governments are investing in infrastructure, but they're doing it at a time when they're facing uh, record debts. Uh, countries have borrowed hugely uh, to get through the COVID pandemic. In Australia, uh, it's around $2 trillion uh, in debt. So given that challenge of uh, the debt overhang, what are the opportunities for Australia and other countries in transitioning to net zero in the infrastructure sector? No, it's a uh, noise. I mean, those, those are unprecedented times. Uh, I think, I mean, if we take a step back, I mean, Australia, debt is significant, uh, but it's still one of the best positioned country uh, in, in the world for investment capacity. The, the debt level, even the, the projection that you, that you mentioned, is still relatively low compared to, to most developed, uh, uh, developed economies. Uh, even after the, the, the pandemic. Uh, so on the government side, uh, obviously we have to be careful with every spending, but it's still, it's still room to act uh, in a sense. The other positive uh, aspect uh, for, for Australia is that it's one of the countries that know best how to leverage private finance when, when it comes to, to infrastructure, uh, more so than, than other um, developed uh, develop economies. Uh, so building on that obviously could help limit the burden of governments. Uh, so not to, not to say this is not a, a serious issue, but there's, there's, there's again, more room to act for, uh, for Australia compared to some, uh, some other countries. Uh, so, so now, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to basically for, for us to basically say how uh, Australia, where they should, you know, the country should invest. But maybe one comparison I can bring is uh, comparison with the, the G20 country. Uh, so what we did uh, for the G20 this year was uh, tracking the infrastructure stimulus trends in response to, to, to COVID. Uh, and that data is, is available online through uh, a tool called the InfraTracker. Uh, and the purpose was really to identify trends for uh, the rural infrastructure in the recovery and, and also uh, get governments to sort of learn from each other and, and encourage them to think differently about how infrastructure should be planned, financed and, and, and delivered. So if you look at that, um, that tracker, tracker data, uh, yes, I mean, those are definitely unprecedented time. Uh, if you look at the total stimulus uh, size, the uh, since since the beginning of 2020, uh, that's around 17% of GDP uh, across the G20. And if you compare that to the global financial crisis, which at the time we, we all thought was the, the end of the world, uh, government spent around 1.5% of GDP. So it's it's no common measure. It's, it's very different. And Australia is also sort of put a significant amount of GDP uh, into, into the, 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 the recovery. Um, so... What is the role of infrastructure within that? What, uh, what we knew from, uh, from, from previous studies that we had done is that infrastructure as the, one of the highest public uh, investment multipliers. So when you invest in infrastructure, you roughly get 1.5 time return on investment. So we knew it was about time for that, you know, after the response that government will actually use infrastructure as a recovery mechanism. And that's exactly what, uh, what, what, what it did. Across the G20, we've seen about 4.5% of GDP spend on infrastructure. So about $3.2 trillion uh, that was announced. Uh, the size of this Australian stimulus at the central government level uh, is around is around 35 billion uh, AUD. Uh, so it's around two percent of GDP. Again, it's uh, so it's significant. Uh, there's still probably room to act compared to uh, to, to to other um, to, to to other governments. Obviously, this has to be added to the normal spending and all the other committed programs and the state investment as well. And that's probably why we're seeing significant tensions on the on the capacity side. So again, spending is one thing delivering it the right way is another is, is another question so i think it's uh invest investing fast yes uh but uh, obviously in the right project uh so if we look at the the type of investment beyond the numbers the, the high level number um 
what is it that government uh, are sort of focusing on when, when it comes to, to that infrastructure spending? What, we, what we've seen is that low carbon transition was indeed the, the number one. So we've classified them into what we call transformative outcomes. So outcomes beyond economic, re economic recovery, which obviously was the, the primary objective of all the, uh, all the stimuluses. Uh, and what we've seen are 30% of the, those stimulus were actually geared towards addressing carbon neutrality. It's a bit lower in, uh, in, uh, in Australia, is about, about 20%, uh, the majority through rail and renewables. Um, but the interesting part is that there was a lot of focus on affordability and digital connectivity. Uh, so I think that, that mainly to address the digital divide that, uh, that Romilly talked about just before. And for those, Australia actually spend more on average than, um, that, than, than other countries when we compare to the overall size of the uh, of the uh, of the stimulus, so maybe a more balanced uh, type type of approach uh, that could benefit maybe from accelerated spending on uh, on uh, on carbon neutrality. Uh, as a side note, uh, when we talk about transition, there was a significant investment in innovation in hydrogen uh, renewables. Actually, renewables investment in Australia was higher than the average uh, for for the G20, uh, and also some spending on carbon capture. Uh, so a lot of um, a lot of spending towards innovation, which uh, I mean, given, given Australia uh, wealth compared to the two other, uh, other countries and ability to innovate is probably uh, something that, uh, that, that you know, could continue and, and benefit the country in the, in, in, in the long term. Uh, one thing that uh, probably was, was missing, but I think has been maybe addressed uh, more recently, is the investment in, um, in transport and especially in uh, zero, um, zero emission vehicles. That, that's pretty strong across all the G20 package, uh, especially in developed economies, but that wasn't really present in the, uh, in the, uh, in the central government stimulus. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, there's been a $2 billion package that was announced under the, the Federal Future Fuels and, and Vehicles Strategy, uh, but that's definitely an area uh, that is going to be critical if we want to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, the, the transport sector is probably one of the hardest. To, to transition, we have solutions when it comes to energy sector, transport sector is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and so I'll, I'll probably finish on that, which is the, the, the crucial role of innovation. Uh, currently, if you look across uh, the G20, if you look at all the strategies around carbon neutrality, they all have a very significant part of um, unproven or yet to be discovered uh, technology um, that and they're absolutely critical in getting to zero. Zero is on a big number, and so if you see this, uh, that means that every single sector is asked to be transitioned. We again, we kind of know how to do it from the energy sector. We have some ideas when it comes to transport, uh, but it, you know everything else is still very much to be discovered, and that's, that's where Australia actually. In the packages, I've invested more in carbon capture, uh, hydrogen research, digitalization of, of infrastructure. Uh, and we think that that innovation is going to be absolutely critical. And there's an opportunity for, uh, uh, for country like Australia to really be a leader and enable the innovation uh, at speed and at scale in time. Well, that, that's a great summary of the situation around the world. And can I just, before I ask the next question, remind everyone if they've got any questions, put them in the Q&A uh, and we'll get to them shortly. If there was just one thing that we could do in Australia to accelerate net zero in infrastructure? In a nutshell, what would that be? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll love, uh, and I would love to say that there's, there's one action that could unlock them all. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a complex challenge. I think we, we'll have to recognize that. I think the, there's probably um, uh, very shortly, because I uh, don't want to go too much over time, I want to leave time for questions. But I think the uh, well, one critical thing is to recognize that, uh, I mean, what, what I call, go we need to go from uh, greener projects to green systems. And that's probably the key challenge. I think for, for the longest time, we, um, you know, we've been happy with, you know, reduction and, uh, and projects that became, you know, a little bit greener step by step. The problem is that we're a little bit running out of time. Uh, the, the infrastructure of 2050, it, we're building it, we're planning it now. Uh, and infrastructure that's built now will need to be compatible with carbon neutrality. Uh, again, there's that risk of stranded assets, uh, but it's also that, um, uh, that, that risk of, you know, building infrastructure that might actually not be useful going forward. So I think recognizing that real team, that real team decision-making uh, is gonna be a crucial first step. Uh, and that's where standards, uh, regulatory framework and, uh, and planning processes 
uh, will actually be uh, absolutely critical. Uh, and the second point, if I, if I may, is probably around innovation and circularity. Embedded carbon is, uh, while it's smaller than all the uh, energy sector uh, is still fairly significant. And unfortunately, embedded carbon stays for a long time. Uh, so again, we kind of need to incorporate, we don't have the luxury of waiting to, you know, to, to address the energy and the transport sectors and then start looking at embedded carbon. We kind of need to look at that now. Uh, so this year, we're actually starting a, 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 an action group uh, under, under the G20, working with different countries, uh, private sector players, to actually look at what, uh, what it would take to actually transition infrastructure uh, and incorporate more circular economy principles. Um, and so we're very keen to sort of work with partners, including in Australia. We're already working with a few uh, to, to, again, sort of um, look at the innovation and, and way to basically address that challenge. Uh, so again, I mean, over... No, overarchingly, I think, yeah, it's not a word, but uh, overall, I think Australia is really well placed to sort of play that um, that leading role in sort of creating that, that innovation, both from a, a process perspective, but also from a technology perspective. Uh, and, uh, and I think collaborating on, on data and the learnings and innovation uh, beyond beyond Australia with other partners will actually absolutely be, uh, be critical. Well, thank you, Henry. And We'll certainly need that innovation because we have to radically shift uh, vast networks like transport and power generation and retrofit our buildings and homes at speed and scale. And I think you've pointed out we need innovation, but we also need a systems approach. And that's a good moment to call on our next panel member, Margot de la Falouz, who's the city system lead at uh, Climate Works Australia. Uh, and uh, Margot, we're very pleased to have you here today. Prior to joining Climate Works, uh, you worked for WWF France as head of advocacy and campaigns for sustainable cities. And you're bringing that knowledge and skill to us here in Climate Works Australia. So welcome, uh, Margot. And if I could start by uh, recalling uh, the COP26 just a few weeks ago where British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that to keep 1.5 degrees in sight to reach global net zero and to protect vulnerable countries from the impacts of climate change means the development of new clean and green infrastructure. Putting that view into an Australian context why does Climate Works see infrastructure as such a critical sector? Thanks, John, and good afternoon, everyone from Brunjeri country here in Melbourne. Um, infrastructure is central to how we live. It determines how we move around, how the energy we consume is produced, how our waste is processed. Um, and so the type of infrastructure that surrounds us really shapes our lifestyle and even our consumption patterns. Um, I'll give you an example and I'll take you to my hometown uh, and region in the south of France. I come from Nice, um, but for the past 10 years I've been living in Paris. Nice is roughly the same distance from Paris than Melbourne is from Sydney. Um, but for the past 10 years that I've been living in Paris, I was able to take the train uh, and in a few hours to be home in Nice. Um, it's cheaper, it's so comfortable and nice, and of course, it's less emissions. Um, how nice would it be on a Friday evening to just be able to jump in the train at Southern Cross to go on your weekend in Sydney and just in a matter of a few hours be in central Sydney? Uh, no stress about security. I don't like that in the airports. Um, and um, of course, that's a a great perspective but we all know that actually uh it's more like an 11 more than an 11 hours train ride from melbourne to sydney and so you might as well fly or drive um so i think that illustrates you know how the type of infrastructure that we have available to us um really is part of our daily lives and shapes the choices that we make about how we go about our lives um, and of course, that translates into the emissions. Uh, it's been mentioned twice, I'll say it third time. Uh, in Australia, 70% of our emissions are influenced 
by infrastructure assets. It's very significant. And actually the most part of this results from the use of these assets. Um, and so, you know, infrastructure such as roads and rails and water and waste uh, treatment facilities and power lines, obviously they enable a certain type of behavior or, or use. And so um, the choices that we make about uh, the infrastructure we build will be critical to enable emissions reductions because they will be critical to determine uh, what we do in our lives. Um, and if, you know, it's a low carbon or high carbon uh, type of uh, lifestyle or behavior. Um, so it is very important uh, from a systems change perspective to make the right choices today. And the reason for that, as Romilly mentioned, is that most of the infrastructure we build today will still be standing in 2050 which Australia is now have achieved net zero emissions. So the decisions we make today about what infrastructure we build will determine whether or not uh, we achieve this goal. Um, so I guess to summarize, uh, infrastructure is a really critical sector. It influences the lion's share of our country's emissions uh, and it has the potential to enable low carbon lifestyles if we make the right choices. Um, I'll just finish with the last example. Um, how great would it be to be able to go across town, you know, in, in public transport, reliable, comfortable public transport, uh, reading your book, or uh, perhaps even cycling and doing your exercise at the same time, instead of being stuck and frustrated in traffic. Um, so not only is it about um, emissions, it's really about our quality of life um, as well. Well, you've talked about rail and, and public transport there. Of course, one of the other big transformation that's going to be required is transforming to electric vehicles. And the challenges we've had in Australia uh, in doing that have been pretty substantial. We've got very low percentage of electric vehicles now in our system. To, to achieve that uh, transformation, we're going to need new incentives, uh, potentially new frameworks uh, for uh, rolling out electric vehicles. Can you tell us what are some of the key shifts that are going to be needed across the infrastructure sector, including transport, to enable that transformation to net zero? Yeah, unfortunately, I think I'm just going to reiterate what both Romilly and Henry have highlighted, which is that the single most important shift that we need is a change of mindsets and decision-making processes. Uh, we really must move from net zero and emissions being an option or a co-benefit to it being a prerequisite of how we deliver uh, projects in infrastructure and, and what infrastructure we build. And that, that means that we need to embed emissions and the net zero goal in every decision we make. Um, and essentially we know that uh, net zero is the only destination we should get to this decade. So now the question is rather, how do we solve for it? Um, and it's been mentioned, but uh, that means in practice, it means that uh, things such as business cases and cost benefit analysis should be a way to determine the most cost effective way to get to net zero rather than some uh, tools where it's, it could be a competing parameter between costs and emissions. Um, so coming back to EVs, uh, what does it mean? Um, well, it means, for example, that um, if we make net zero central to key pieces of regulations, such as building codes and planning schemes, then these policies, these regulations, they should provide for the fact that EVs should make up 30% of the total fleet uh, of cars by 2030. Um, currently they don't. So that's just to illustrate, um, you know, in, in relation to EVs, the sort of shifts that we need. Um, but I want to open up the discussion from EVs. And I don't know if you've seen this meme uh, coming out of COP. Um, EVs did get all the attention in the transport discussions at COP. Um, but really achieving net zero will require massive efficiency gain 
in transport and it will require being less car dependent. And so what that means for infrastructure is that when we make decisions about um, the infrastructure that we should build, we should prioritize infrastructure that will not support, that will support the most efficient and the least emission intensive technologies. And these are very high end technologies, such as your own feet or a bike or a bus or a tram. Um, and we know, and it's been proven that they are the most cost effective, less resource efficient, and obviously less, less carbon intensive modes. Um, so to come back to our you know, processes and decision-making, um, the net zero goal should be prioritized in all stages of the life of infrastructure assets from the very beginning and the very idea of uh, whether and what infrastructure we should build to obviously uh, the question of materials uh, that we use to, to build them. Um, and that's really important because materials are at the moment, they're 10% of the footprint. Uh, the use is 55%. So um, they're both very important, but I really want to emphasize the need to, uh, to focus also on the use. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here for now. Well, that's a great point you make about the lack of focus often on say walking and cycling compared to uh, what might be called big infrastructure and big investments, whether it's big roads uh, or electric vehicles. And it always fascinates me that when we talk about infrastructure, we think nothing of spending billions of dollars on a highway. And yet it seems a big deal when we spend 10 or $15 million on a bit of a bike path. So uh, we just don't, we don't, as you say, we don't focus enough on those alternatives. Now, the last question I wanted to ask you, I, I sort of asked some of the others too, and it was, it's hard and it's sort of a silly question, but what is the one thing, the one key action uh, that you think will move the infrastructure sector forward? If there was one thing. I'll get to that. I'll just take one minute to add yep. on what you just said. Yep. Um, give another example, which I think is quite uh, illustrative about these choices. Um, in Sydney, the total volume of traffic crossing the, the harbour increased by 40% in the three years after the Sydney Harbour Tunnel opened. That is 10 times the rate of population growth. And that relates to something that we call induced demand, which means that actually more roads don't solve congestion. They just bring more traffic because it makes driving more convenient. I think that example is very powerful of what we've just, just said. Now, um, to get to your question about the single, you know, like a key action that the sector can do at the moment, um, what we've all discussed about, you know, shifting decision making, it really is a paradigm shift. So it is easier said than done in a way. Um, and it is a wicked complex problem. And these problems really required stakeholders across the board to work together uh, to achieve this shared purpose of net zero emissions. We know that no single stakeholder holds 100% of the solution. It's a bit like the moon landing. Uh, we don't, I, prob I personally don't think that uh, government or entrepreneurs or research alone could have achieved it. But by coming all together and bringing the solutions to the table, agreeing on this great vision and working towards it, they've made it possible. And we've seen this, um, you know, happening in, uh, for example, the finance sector with TCFD, which has been mentioned already, and we've had significant and global leap forward in terms of how we account for climate in, in how we make business essentially. And closer to home in Australia, um, we have the Australian Industry and Energy Transition Initiatives uh, that Climate Works is convening, which is also bring, bringing together to the table government, industry, and the finance sector, together designing the pathways about how we decarbonize Australia's heavy industry. And the collective power of these usual and unusual suspects working together on the way forward is incredibly bigger than if they were doing it each separately in their own corner or even you know, in parallel. 
Um, and together they really set the new rules um, and the future direction. So imagine if that existed for infrastructure and this is, I think, the key action we need, a platform to share stories of what works, what doesn't work and paint a picture. Um, and we're working on this at the moment at Climate Works. And I would like to invite our listeners to consider what they can and should do to uh, really embed that net zero in how we do infrastructure and perhaps to join us in this effort. Thanks very much, Margot. It's now time for some questions and I'm gonna jump right into it with a question that came out of the uh, chat from Billy Giles Corty, who's one of our most distinguished city professors uh, based at RMIT. And I'm gonna ask this of Romilly. Um, when we talk about infrastructure, does this include social infrastructure? Because as Billy uh, says, uh, social infrastructure, local social infrastructure can help deliver the 15 minute city being advocated by C40 or the 20 minute neighborhood promoted in Melbourne. So what's the role of social infrastructure, Romilly? So it definitely does include social infrastructure. Uh, in the q and I actually responded to Billy with a couple of uh, areas to go to, but I'll publicly respond. So the infrastructure we look at is economic infrastructure and, the so and social infrastructure as well. So we're looking at green and blue infrastructure, uh, 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 healthcare, education, uh, housing, uh, but under transport, we actually pick up uh, active travel and, and cycling under transport. And we pick it up in a number of our uh, policy platforms. In the COVID, uh, the impacts of, of, uh, of, of COVID on infrastructure in the late uh, 2020 report that we released, we talked about the huge uptake of cycling uh, through COVID and the importance of that and, and the, uh, the response and, and the opportunities around, around that. And we saw some pop-up cycling uh, ways happening around Australia and, and the response to communities for that. In the plan, uh, we talk about the importance of social infrastructure. We actually go further and we say, we need to value our social infrastructure. Uh, and we, it needs to be valued just as, well as, as, as economic infrastructure is valued. And the reason being is you can see uh, again through COVID, the importance that the community placed on access to green and blue infrastructure, green infrastructure particularly, and the increase in uh, visiting our state and national parks and having uh, access to a park close to where we live. We believe that's crucially important and that is picked up both under, um, under place, but also under uh, sustainability and resilience and the social infrastructure chapter. So it very much is an important area that we focus on and we'll continue to focus on. And we're actually working with, um, uh, well, we're not working with them, they're actually doing the work. Uh, New South Wales Department of uh, Planning, Industry and Environment are doing some really great work on, on valuing uh, green and blue infrastructure, for instance, and, and we're participating in the research that they're undertaking. So uh, through, you can look online at all our documentation, we very much pick this up. No, I, I think it's a fascinating point. And social infrastructure, of course, covers lots of different things. Uh, and out of COVID, where we're changing our lifestyles, I would have hoped that people are seeing we can live and work differently if the social infrastructure is there in our local community. So we don't have to build uh, roads or rail or any other way to get there because it's in our local community. But social infrastructure is important both for um, the heat island effect so we want to ensure that we maintain our green canopy for our heat island effect, but it's also great for mental health issues, uh, access and, act and active as well. So when we're looking at uh, wanting our kids to get outside and play, but all of us, we should be using, we should have access to and be using our green and blue infrastructure to be fit. And then that takes, that also uh, impacts another bit of social infrastructure being healthcare to reduce the spend that's needed on, on healthcare. So the benefits of social infrastructure and its importance to community in place uh, can't be underestimated. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to ask uh, Henry that this question and it's from David. How do you see technology, in particular big data utilisation, affecting sustainability and risk mitigation across infrastructure assets? So big data and technology affecting sustainability and risk mitigation. Uh, well, I mean, as, 
you know, as, as I mentioned, I think uh, we, um, when it comes to technology first, uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen yet a, a strategy that will not uh, achieve 2050 uh, without new technology. Uh, and in, for, sometimes it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pain to read them, but, you know, carbon capture, et cetera, are usually, uh, you know, the way to sort of um, reduce that number to zero. Uh, so I think technology is going to be essential, um, and obviously we we have yet to sort of fully see which one's going to actually sort of bring the, the most benefit. I mean, I, I've talked about electric electric vehicles, uh, and um, you know, at the same time, it's uh, you know, it's fair. To, we we also know that you know we're not going to all be driving uh, you know two tons or three ton Tesla. Uh, in 2050, because that's not compatible with carbon neutrality, even if all the electricity was from from solar uh, or, or wind power. So obviously, there's still a lot that needs to be that needs to be addressed. And some of the solutions sometimes are actually not, you know, eventually not about technology. They're around sort of creating, um, you know, places that are sort of more, uh, you know, attractive to to, to walking and uh, sort of closer social infrastructure, etc. So I think that's where the systemic nature of of those things are very important. Technology can solve some of the issues. But it's not necessarily the, the one that's going to so solve it all. We have to sort of think think about it from from a system perspective, and th and that's where I think data projection scenarios becomes very very important. It's because there's there's no way that you know, not, none of a brain can actually really sort of model or sort of completely understand and sort of uh, you know rationalize what what could work. Uh, and, and to and to deliver that, I mean, to address that complexity and to address it at scale and at speed, we're going to need to uh, to share data and evidence faster than than ever than ever before. And that's really a, a mission that we do, we're trying to play, which is not so much doing the research ourselves, but making sure that whatever innovation happens, whether it's the way innovation get finance uh, or what works, what doesn't work, that that innovation sort of spread across the world as fast as possible. Because again, when it comes to infrastructure, we just don't have time. It, it's literally, it's, it, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's now, never, uh, but, you know, again, the infrastructure that we build now will be there in 2050. So data will enable speed and also, uh, you know, enable us to learn from each other and, and conceptualize those, those, those problems at the, at the system level. And a question for uh, Margot from Siri. How can embodied carbon targets and circular economy principles move from the nice to have to the need to do? Yeah, I think we've mentioned procurement principles earlier in the discussion, um, and but also um, equally, Romilly talked about tenders and we talked about cost benefit analysis um, and tools such as life cycle assessments. Um, all these need to uh, have you know, for, as their intended goal to reduce the emissions. And so if that is the main principle that these tools are intending to respond to, then automatically we, we should move from a nice to have for reducing embodied carbon uh, to a must have uh, because they will be the most cost effective way to address the goal of uh, achieving the least emission intensive infrastructure. And I think it's a very relevant point at the moment as uh, the states and the national government are considering the changes to the national construction code and particularly whether they're gonna introduce um, seven star building requirements for energy efficiency in new homes. And I think the point you made earlier is a critical one that we should be judging these decisions on the assumption that we're targeting net zero. And if we are gonna target net zero, one of the most efficient ways we can do that is in building efficiency. And yet the cost benefit analysis that was produced for that seemed to ignore the net zero target or not assume that we had to meet it. So uh, we've heard from a great group of panelists today. I'd like to thank them uh, very much. Uh, Romley Maju, the Chief Executive Officer for Infrastructure Australia. And Romley, congratulations on all the reports of Infrastructure Australia, which really are leading edge. Uh, and I think it's something we can be really proud of in Australia that we've got some of the leading thinking in infrastructure and uh, green buildings and green property.
Uh, Henry Blass, the Chief Content Officer for the Global Infrastructure Hub. Thank you so much, Henry. And it was great to get the, the global perspective from you and to uh, understand that Australia's got a fair way to go to, to achieve what uh, is expected around the world. But as you said, in some areas, we're moving ahead really quickly, like renewables. We've shown it can be done. And Margot uh, Delafaloos, who's spending the weekend on a train to Sydney, it'll only take you 18 hours. And uh, you know you, you may not be allowed in when you get there because you're coming from Victoria. Uh, but nevertheless, it's great to hear from you as well. Uh, to all the audience, thank you for participating. After today's webinar, you're gonna receive an email from us with a recording of the discussion so you can share it uh, with your network. To find out uh, more about uh, these um, sessions that we've had, uh, you can go to that website, uh, the Climate Works website, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with all of you on this really important mission that we have of achieving net zero as soon as possible. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening.